and thank you for letting me talk today. My presentation titled Is Witnessing Enough? is the study that formed my postgrad dissertation in Anthrozoology, University of Exeter. The study attempted to recognise those involved in the relations of bearing witness when situated in political frameworks of anthropocentrism, exceptionalism and sovereignty. My aim was to centre the witness and witnesses themselves by engaging with the narratives of those who find themselves entrapped within the role of witness and to investigate relevant literature relating to bearing witness. Throughout, I found myself returning to paradigms of feminist care that intertwine with constructs of bearing witness. Findings highlighted the intersection of systems of power in the perception and treatment of non-human animals and the witness's own vulnerability through exposure to these systems that may conflict with her ethical values and indeed cause her to reevaluate her identity as it becomes entangled with those who are witnessed. The third aspect is perhaps the most essential, the testimony itself. Born through witnessing, the testimony has the potential to transform the listener and thereby they too become situated within the narrative. The intimacy of narrative may reposition those involved in bearing witness. This research is rooted in the embodied experiences of real and sentient lives. The subjects of these lives have not had the opportunity to give consent to my using their experiences for this study. And therefore I would like to voice that I have endeavoured to respect and honour those who are a part of this work. The photos I've used to illustrate are of dogs who have come from Romanian shelters and who have or do live with me. The topic may reveal sensitive subject matter that could impact the listener. Alongside the investigation is an autoethnographic thread, reflections entangled within the theories and constructs that guided my thoughts and questions. It is this that I would like to bring to you today. This testimony encompasses many of the facets of the study, including responsibility, recognition, denial, becoming and grief. This is the testimony of the seen protagonist, Nina. But in some ways, it also speaks of the unseen and ungrievable lives. The time spent with non-human others has offered me opportunities to examine my own ethics and beliefs, particularly in my role as a foster for Romanian dogs. These dogs are imported to the United Kingdom for a non-government organisation that cares for a fluctuating number of dogs in the vicinity of a large town in Western Moldavia. Some dogs have been rehomed directly from the public shelter that houses approximately 400 canines and a small number have been free living or abandoned dogs who have needed medical attention in the veterinary clinic and then taken into lo local foster care. There's a third group of dogs who are regularly fed and remain free living in the surrounding area. Though the lives of the free living dogs have many challenges and are shortened when compared to some of the residents of the shelter, they nevertheless have autonomy over their lives. The shelter dogs themselves have less opportunity to make choices and to take control over many aspects that impact them. Noise, location, social interaction, access to resources such as food, water, shade and warmth may be out of their control and therefore impact levels of stress and feelings of safety. Many dogs develop observable coping mechanisms, stereotypies and other behavioural changes. The old, young and smaller dogs are particularly vulnerable in overcrowded pens. As I observe these dogs through the distance lens of social media, I bear witness to their daily challenges. Those who run up to the front of the run desperate to have some brief interaction with the human who is filming them. Those who bark through fear or excitement. Those who simply lie and reciprocate the gaze. And the ones who cower at the back in an attempt to be invisible. The 
the sin creates uncomfortable choices. Though the shelter volunteers give a short list of the dogs they would like to be rehomed in the UK, few of these dogs will actually make the journey. Through these short moments of video and randomly captured photographs, a life may change. Questions run through my head. How do I choose which dog to foster? Is that the best choice for this dog? What will happen to those who remain in the shelter? Thinking over these questions causes me to elicit feelings associated with bearing witness. The embodied states of guilt, shame, grief and sometimes despair, while I repeatedly watch the videos of interned individuals for just a few seconds of their lives. Lives that unremittingly continue without change, unless they're noticed. I feel the buzz of anxiety in the pit of my stomach, the dull ache of overwhelm, the restless heaviness of guilt and shame from the burden of making life-changing decisions. I feel confliction, how dare I perceive it as a burden when I have autonomy and agency over my life, yet others have little freedom to make decisions over theirs. But perhaps most of all, I grieve for the lives that are only half lived. They exist with little to live for other than to survive from day to day. I become humbled by these dogs, their stoicism and tenacity to meet each day fresh. The guilt associated with conscious denial of those who I know are suffering and under threat of harm is a constant partner in my role as fosterer. I tell the story of those who live with me, but in their story, I am aware of millions of untold stories. In part, I absolve my inaction by helping the few lives that find me, but in their narrative, I remi I'm reminded of the unseen, unspoken lives who are denied agency, autonomy or life itself. For every one of these animals, their life matters to them. Bearing witness to the animals visible to me causes me to consider how integrating what I feel is helpful or indeed necessary. Without them as intermediary, without the relationship I have with them, would the unknown lives of others impact me as they do? The dissonance is a stark reminder of the inconsistencies of power and privilege that are intertwined in human-animal relations. The unstoried lives of those who are witnessed from afar are encompassed within the lives of those we come to know. They merge into the dog who is chosen, whose story is witnessed, whose life is changed without her consent. Her story will speak of those left behind and of the unlived and unlivable experiences they may never know. Their lives are brought to our attention through the chosen dog, the life they could have lived. What of the perceptions and expectations placed upon the dog who leaves the familiar turmoil of living in the shelter? This dog alone takes the place of all of the dogs, yet she has her own life her own experiences of the world, her own story that isn't reliant on human interpretation or assent. I recognise this and take a step back to enable her to express agency. But as a human and carer, this is hard to do. I have to override my desire to help her adjust to her new life, to protect her. And indeed, it is necessary to find a different way of relating and living beside her. The one connection we have is the reciprocity of distance. She wishes me to keep away and I respond to her wishes. I ask myself whether I've made her life more difficult by taking her from familiar surroundings. The insipid influence of sovereignty and anthropocentric hierarchies giving me the right to make this decision. I've made assumptions on her behalf and negated her autonomy by agreeing to offer foster for her. Yet, as she lies at the back of her run, only her eyes moving for days and weeks on end, does she consider this as a betrayal or is she simply attempting to cope as best she can? As her eyes follow my movements, 
I wonder what she's thinking of this human who has turned her world upside down. Living with a dog who's spent the first seven months not moving in my presence has caused me to reflect deeply about my own motivations and my capacity to love. It is hard to love another being who clearly has no wish to interact. But without love, where is the connection to build trust and reciprocity? To truly bear witness, there has to be more than observation. Witnessing brings with it a felt sense of compassion, of walking beside the other and listening to their inner needs and wishes. To do this, I realised that I needed to be authentic to myself, to be open to my own needs and admit, admit to feelings and emotions that were uncomfortable and challenging. Unless I was prepared to unravel and examine these, this dog would know I was holding back. It dawned on me that my reserve was mirrored in her response. Picking apart beliefs can elicit feelings of vulnerability, but this mirrored the felt sense that the dog had been enduring. Instead of my leading this journey of forming some sort of bonded relationship, I became the follower. I let go of our expectations and self-imposed pressures that prevented me from intuiting the nuances necessary to develop our relationship. The journey wasn't about me and what I could bring. It was her story, her voice to be heard. This realisation was the catalyst. It evoked changes in my beliefs and I think in hers. The stark realisation of how, as a self-perceived witness, I had been preventing healing because I was subconsciously bringing an othering bias to the relationship, gave me cause to re-evaluate my beliefs. Witnessing is not welfare. Witnessing is walking beside another until we have a felt sense of what it is to be the other. The intersubjectivity of witnessing sits apart from observation. Gradually, the dog felt able to express herself at first simply lying on her opposite side when I was present, her head towards me rather than facing away. The smallest increments of change saw a softening of her expression and body, the tension dissipating over the months as her breath deepened and she found peace. Letting go of egocentric beliefs presented its own experiences for me. Unraveling layers from the past that offered a protective cloak and exploring alternative constructs and worldviews. Witness non-human others don't have the luxury of making these choices. They are manipulated into situations that force them to cope in any way possible in order to live. There may have been no intentional abuse towards this dog, but without doubt she suffered for many years. She felt fear, her need to escape was denied. She was one of hundreds of dogs who exist at the shelter and one of the billions of non-human animals who endure coercion and abuse for the length of their lives and deaths. Can bearing witness take a life beyond existence? Can it give value to the witnessed themselves? The protagonist of my narrative takes the dual role of witnessed and witness. During her recovery, she gave testimony to the witnessed atrocities, not through discourse, but through embodied expression, as she gradually released feelings associated with trauma and found strength in safety and trust. Her resistance was articulated in the form of dissociation as she made herself invisible to the world. Visibility brought with it vulnerability. I question whether it is ethical to make her visible now through this narrative and have endeavoured to turn away from victim paradigms. Her grief for the loss of the familiar was palpable. I suspect not only was she grieving for her cohorts, but also for how she had previously learned to cope and live. To live with an animal who is experiencing grief is hard. I could do little to lighten her burden. 
I simply witnessed her suffering, feeling guilt and shame for having been involved in bringing her to this place. I was humbled by this little dog who strived day by day to retain her dignity and selfhood. Grief not only touches those who are present, but those too who continue to listen and speak the narratives of lives. Her grief, though hers alone, is the representation of grief endured by nations of non-human animals who remain unwitnessed and unstoried. This narrative reiterates the role of testimony. Co-constitutive relations of becoming, of bearing on witnessing, because they bring meaning to the testimony beyond that of intellectual observations. They invite emotional engagement between the subject, the witness, and those who listen to the testimony to engender an embodied sense of becoming. The testimony becomes its own entity in others' minds and thoughts, yours to take forward as you choose. Cool. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Um, my presentation uh, is looking uh, at grief um, in primates, but it's looking much more at it from a zoologically housed point of view. Um, this is, again, off the back of my dissertation for my MA. Um, and I looked at something a little bit different because, again, one of the joys of, of the, the anthrozoology course is that it's really very much kind of made me take a step back and really consider the human element uh, when it comes to it. And obviously, I myself are from a zoo background, uh, so when it comes to it, we know full well the impact that the visiting public can have. So my presentation is basically looking at how can zoological collections, and if they can, basically meet both the needs of those grieving non-human primates and those of the visiting public. Now, I will give you uh, a trigger warning because obviously we are going to be discussing uh, deceased animals, including young primates uh, and there are a few photos in there as well just to kind of highlight the elements that take place okay so I just wanted to give you that warning uh, beforehand so just to give you a little bit of a brief uh, history into primate thanatology really um, it's actually something that was kind of picked up in the late 60s and early 70s um, Jane Goodall uh, found uh, chimpanzees carrying the corpse of a newly uh, born uh, chimp who had unfortunately passed away very soon after birth, um, and she observed them carrying it around post-death and, and recognised the fact that this was no longer a living individual, um, whereas Teleki actually found the grouping of uh, a chimpanzee group basically based around an accidental death that had occurred. Um, and since then, it's really kind of taken on board and it's really kind of grown as a study. But to be honest with you, it's only really in the last 15 to 20 years that it's really kind of blossomed as such. Um, one of the key pieces was a piece by Anderson in 2010, which looked at the death of a matriarchal chimpanzee in a captive environment. Um, and the decision was made, as opposed to what would normally occur, to bring the individual out and to maybe put them to sleep, which is a lot of a, a usual process that would happen in a zoological collection. The decision was made to actually leave her within the group with her family uh, and to video it and to see the responses of the group. Um, and there was a huge plethora of different responses from this group as such. Um, and they got to see the whole process from the spending time with the deceased after they'd passed, uh, cleaning the corpse uh, of bits of straw, things like that, um, to the fact that upon removal of the body, the actual family um, refused to visit the location in which the female had passed away. And this was a, uh, an area in which they had visited and slept perpetually during their time in captivity. So they actually made a concerted effort to, to move away from this. Um, and they all saw things like increased lethargy um, and a reduce in appetite as well. And because of these kind of pieces, it's really kind of developed and looked at a broad range of primate species uh, since that time. 
Um, and one of the things we're going to look at today is something called infant corpse carrying. I'll refer to it as ICC, uh, and that's in which a, a female, the mother, will carry the deceased body of their young. And we're also going to talk about group responses to the death of adult conspecifics as well. And just to give you a very brief idea of the range of species that this actually covers, you know, there is research out there predominantly in wild populations. Um, covering broad species, uh, broad range of apes, old world monkeys, new world monkeys, calotrichids, uh, and even a little bit into your strepsor and your lemur population as well. So there's a huge variety of literature out there, and it's becoming a very, very um, popular, should we say, area of research. Um, but I think one of the things is why? Why would I talk about it? Why? Why did I? I spend what seems like an inordinate amount of time of my masters talking about grief. Um, well. The prior work I'd undertaken, uh, I'd looked at the prevalence of grief and mourning in primates, so looking at where it existed, how was it actually displayed in primate groupings. Um, and another area that I looked at was the comparisons between human and non-human primates, because quite often, when, whenever we talk about these technical, more in-depth behaviours when it comes to our animals, um, for example, the idea of culture and so forth, um, quite often we feel this anthropocentric necessity to compare them with us humans in order to say, this is what exists, this is the element of it. Um, and one of the things that I found during my studies um, is that, you know, just for something to exist, it doesn't mean it has to mirror us as such. They can quite easily exist with differing approaches. Um, and that's one of the things that kind of stood out for me. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, one of the, the most important and probably interesting and exciting things for me personally was the gap in current research. So like I said previously, there's an enormous amount of research out there on wild populations, on the prevalence and duration of all these behaviors, but there's a real, real gap when it comes to our um, research in zoological collections. Um, and, and to be honest with you, you know, it's quite clear why that might be because death in the zoo is, you know, it's quite a taboo topic still due to the impact of social media, the media in general, the visiting public, how they can be negatively impacted by this. So as such, you can kind of see and you can kind of appreciate why zoological collections aren't undertaking a lot of this research about death. So from a methodology point of view, apart from the, the literature research side of things, I also looked at anonymous online surveys for keepers. It was very important for me to keep it anonymized to hopefully gain more information from them. And also um, anonymous interviews as such as well. So any data that I would take from those interviews would basically be anonymized so as not to come back to them or the collection they worked with. One of the things I wanted to make sure in my research was this was not a critique of what zoos are doing at the moment. This is about filling a gap in research and actually hopefully developing ideas that could support this. Um, and also the other side of things was that I wanted to look at the visiting public's point of view as well. And I wanted to find out what they believe the best approaches for zoological collections was when it came to the death of uh, a primate in their care. Um, and as I go through this presentation, the results from these uh, surveys basically are embedded throughout the areas because they kind of cover lots of different aspects as such. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about infant corpse carrying. Now, obviously, you know, this is one of those things that has a hugely emotive uh, response uh, when you discuss it and when you see it and, 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 you know, you see the visual element of this behavior. Um, and one of the most important things when it comes to this is obviously um, the broad range of behaviors that we see, but also the broad range of species that this occurs in. Okay, this is, this is not just one or two species. This is an, a, quite a few species perform a very similar set of behaviors. Now, ICC is basically where the mothers will continue to carry the deceased young for a period of time. And obviously the death could be a range of different reasoning behind it. Um, they will carry out grooming behaviors. Uh, aimed at the deceased young. Uh, often, as you can see in the bottom corner here of this female gelada, they quite often carry in the natural ventral position where the young would actually be positioned and grabbing on in a natural setting. Um, and with this in itself, there's obviously lots of mindsets as to why this is, this is happening. Um, lots of perceived influences, lots of different ideas behind it. A lot of them seem to believe it's an innate uh, behavioral response. A lot of people believe that it, maybe it's a hormonal response that post birth those hormones are still kicking in those natural behaviors to care for young as such. Um, and because of that, you know, it, it, there's this mindset that it's a very natural thing to possibly occur. And 
One of the things that, that does come up, and this is where it becomes quite an interesting thing in itself, is that obviously in some species, we do actually see cannibalism occur at the end of it. And in this instance, in, in the presentation, you've seen it in a tonkia macaque, but we also see it in chimpanzees as well, another species. So for collections, there is that level of wariness uh, as to how long they would allow the female to have access to their young as such because of the potential uh, cannibalism of the young and whether or not that may influence the public's perception and maybe support of this behavior. So ICC in captive environments is, like I said, prevalent across multiple species. And this was where a lot of my interviews came through and were fantastic because people had a lot of experience in it. Um, the findings tended to find that there was an increased duration. So uh, females would carry the young for a much longer duration uh, in captivity than they would to their wild counterparts. Uh, and when you look at it, it kind of makes sense really because there's less pressures there's less um necessity to go and find food resource water resources avoid predators that kind of stuff um and actually also the conditions are more favorable for the uh that reduces the speed in which the body breaks down as well so what we're actually finding is that the the the, the body of the the young uh, primate actually would be in a better condition for a longer sustained period of time so as such their, the connection may be longer with the female that's carrying it. Um, there's a range of approaches in zoological collections as to how to manage it, because again, it's a very emotive aspect. And for a member of the public to view this behavior is something that could create a plethora of responses that are very individualized on, on that uh, human. Um, so there's a range of approaches, some attempt at the removal of the young, uh, they may offer treats and, and things like that as a kind of like a, a swap, if you will, uh, for the removal, they don't tend to see obviously for welfare point of view, there's no forced removal uh, side of things, but they will try and do it in which the female will give up, if you will, and, and pass on the, the, the deceased young. Um, other collections approach uh, is a little bit more standoff. So basically they'll take a step back and they'll put educational signage and social media posts, Edinburgh Zoo, very uh, classic example of this one. They put it all across their social media pages and they basically had signage from the moment you walked in the zoological collection, explaining that um, we have a situation in which a female is carrying the deceased young. And as such, you may see that today, that we have taken the decision not to move them off show because that would affect them more behaviorally. And so the decision has been made to allow her to perform these natural behaviors. And, and again, this is where the educational side of things kicks in and allows people to make a choice, which I think is, as we go through it, a, a hugely important part of it. Um, moving on to the responses to the death of adult conspecifics, you know, again, there's a huge variety of responses against different uh, primate groupings, everything from shows of aggression towards the corpse. Uh, there's been uh, instances where people believe uh, they're trying to garner a reaction from the corpse to ascertain whether or not it's actually dead. Um, a lot of uh, studies show the primates' um, attempts at recognizing when an animal goes from life to death as such. Um, and there's almost this kind of element of recognition as you kind of watch the process uh, take place, which is hugely interesting. Um, there's also evidence to show that related individuals and those with closer bonds with the corpse, you know, in, in previous in life as such, uh, would spend much more time with them, uh, with the corpse. They would spend more time grooming it. They would spend more time in study uh, and just in general, spend more time sitting around the deceased as such. Now, one of the things that I found as my research took place is, as with any research, you kind of find yourself going off in those odd little tangents and things. And one of the things that I really wanted to look at was what happens in a zoological collection when it comes to death. Because obviously, if we've got ICC occurring in a, zoo, in a zoo, it's already within the group, you can see this. But an awful lot of deaths that occur in zoological collections either take place um, in the veterinary practice during surgery, they take place because potentially um, it's euthanasia for the welfare of the animal as such. And so in those situations, one of the things that, that kind of rang true for me and was quite interesting was the fact that all that's happened in that group is the primate group have seen the individual taken away. They would have been shut off, sedated and, and moved away as such. And then there's no end to it. There's literally no process in which there is the recognition that death has occurred. And whereas you can see it in wild populations in which there is that, that process, you can see it occur and you can see that the, the the point in which they recognize the, the difference in its state, 
you're not seeing that in a captive environment. And, and one of the things I kind of talked about it from, and yes, one could argue it's slightly anthropomorphic, but it's the lack of closure, okay? The fact that if the body is not returned, will they actually perform natural grieving behaviors? And I think that's a super important aspect. Um, and there was a little bit of research. And again, this, this was very useful from the uh, information provided from the keepers that have actually gone through this as well. Um, so there was a, a variety of procedures where people would actually return the body to the group. So there was a, a mixture from direct contact in which they left the corpse in with them or they returned the corpse to them and they, and they kind of were, were just allowed access as such. Um, there was protected contact in which they provided the corpse and allowed the group to view it through mesh fencing, but could also reach it and gain physical contact. So they got that tactile element of it. And then there was purely the visual contact side of things. Now, again, this lends itself to very different responses. Um, and one of the things that I found is that collections tried to avoid allowing direct contact because there was the fear that it might cause damage to the body or that the group might drag the body away and make it very difficult for them to access afterwards. Um, but I found that was quite interesting because actually as a point, very few, there is very little evidence to suggest that actual aggressive responses take place towards corpses in the wild. Um, displays tend to take place. Um, you know, uh, the, the hitting of a corpse per se to generate a response, but very little kind of like, without wanting to be too graphic, kind of extreme levels of, of damage to a corpse. There's almost that, that respect and, and reverence, if you will, uh, when it comes to interacting with it. So it was interesting that collections had that idea and, and that approach to it. Um, quickly looking at the public opinion, because I appreciate I'm talking on and it's so difficult to get a 15,000 word uh, dissertation into 15 minutes. Um, but the public opinion really quite surprised me. Um, because there was an awareness of grief occurrence in animals, whether or not that was from documentaries, education, visiting zoological collections. But what was interesting is that there was an assumption that most animals grieve. It wasn't supported by research. It was just, well, why wouldn't they grieve? Surely all animals grieve. So that was something that I found quite interesting. Um, there was a huge level of support for animals being put off show during the grieving process. So people, the public, were happy not to view a species if it meant that they had time to grieve the death. Um, there was almost a universal preference for being informed that a death had taken place, so they wanted to be educated and told about it so they could make their decisions appropriately. Um, and if ICC was taking place on show, then again, visitors wanted signage in place so they could choose whether or not to visit it. Uh, and, more, and what was really interesting as well, because I wanted to look at it slightly from a children's point of view, because obviously the majority of people that visit zoological collections are um, families. Uh, and there was a high proportion of visitors that felt actually it was okay to experience death at the zoo with their families. It was almost um, in some of the, the qualitative responses, they felt it was actually okay because they could talk to their children about death because it was a non-emotive interaction. It wasn't a pet. It wasn't a family member. It was just they could talk about death without the, the emotional element of it. And so a lot of them actually felt that they would quite benefit from experiencing death in the zoo in that way as such. So looking at my conclusions then, um, first of all, the public were very much likely to support a zoo's decision um, as long as they were transparent. As long as the, the zoo was clear about why they were doing it and what they were doing, the public were, were very much likely to support the zoo's decision. Um, ICC durations tended to be uh, affected by a range of influences and it tended to be longer in captivity. And one of the things that I found about that is obviously zoos need to plan for this. They need to have something in place that is this going to be a two week, one month, two month, even to the extent sometimes three to four months. There was evidence to show that in one situation it was that long. And this is compared to a wild situation where it's, it's normally around a month to a month and a half. So zoos have to plan for this if that's going to be the case. Um, there is the argument that a, a non-return of body, okay, so if this is an adult individual that's passed away uh, in the veterinary setting, um, and if that's not being returned to the group, then that really is restricting their opportunity to perform natural grieving behaviours. Um, and I think one of the things that really stood out for me when I was having this, when I was undertaking this research and having these conversations with peers and, and tutors and so forth, it wasn't so much as why would collections return the body to the group? It was much more on the lines of, well, why would they not? What actually 
are we are we gaining from not returning that body to allow this group to experience and have that emotional connection and and closure if you will um and lastly um and one of the things that i think we all find when we research and, and when we talk about this with the animals that we work with is that zoos need to consider an individualized approach for each primate death okay you you cannot do a one species fits all you cannot do a um, well, this is what we'll do for chimps, this is what we'll do for gorillas, because it doesn't work, because your group dynamic is very different, because of the influences, the experiences of in that group, we have to approach each one individually, and that's super important. So lastly, just potential areas that I'm looking at for future research, because with all research, it creates a number of other avenues. Um, one of the things that I really want to look at is the comparisons between the prevalence and duration of grief-related behaviours in both captivity and the wild. Um, and I'd really like to look at the behavioral responses of captive groups to the return of the, the conspecific cause. Uh, because I think, again, if we can create, find more information, gain more data and more, and when I say data, I don't just mean it from a numbers point of view, because when it comes to death, it's very qualitative, it's very experiential. It's not gonna be a, a ones and zeros kind of thing. But what I'd like to do is gain more information and data to support collections in producing effective ways to manage this. Because I think what we are doing now is now as we find more and more, we learn more about the depths of grief and mourning in our primates, we have to be up with that. We have to be alongside that and supporting them through that process. And I think that's definitely one of the most important things that collections need to be looking at as well from supporting the, the behavioral repertoire of their primates. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, and please, yes, any questions, please feel free. Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. First of all, let me thank you for the opportunity. As you can see on the screen, our ongoing research tries to understand companion animal bereavement within the Indian context. The need for the study arises from the fact that there aren't many studies that concentrate on pet loss. And India is one of the countries with the fastest growing pet industries but parents aren't any less prevalent though. In fact, we have seen an increase in the number of pet parents during the pandemic. Till date, to our best knowledge, research has not explored the grief experience following pet loss in the Indian setting. Pets are largely considered as family members and play a significant role in lives of their owners. When a beloved pet passes, pet owners frequently experience disenfranchised grief which is characterized by a lack of emotional support and acceptance from the society. So in our study, we are classifying the grief into ambiguous and unambiguous grief. Unrecognized loss is what is meant by the term ambiguous loss. This happens when uncertainty and unknowable facts can leave a family confused, conflicted or out of control when they are dealing with an ambiguous loss. The loop of the ambiguous loss never ends and there is rarely closure which elongates the process. Why we are focusing on ambiguous grief is because there are several instances where pet is lost by means other than death, for instance, escape, disappearance or theft. And this keeps the pet parent into the loop of ambiguous grief where closure is not possible. Our main goal in the Indian context are to gain a better understanding of how children, adolescents and adults deal with the grief of losing a pet and how the levels of pet attachment modulate this process. Identify the coping mechanisms and support networks that each group relies on, including the veterinarian support. Understand the uniqueness of the grief experience following ambiguous pet loss. Understand veterinarian experience surrounding pet loss. To achieve these aims, we will use a mixed method approach to inco approach incorporating both standardized scales and a narrative approach comprising investigator design semi-structured personal interviews. Coming to participants, we are focusing on children, adolescents, adults and veterinarians. We aim to have 30 participants in each distinct group, as well as 15 participants who experienced ambiguous grief among children, adolescents, and adults. 
we are trying to get demographic data such as age, sex, family size or socioeconomic status, composition, number and species of pets, experience pet loss before and number of pets when the pet loss occurred. We may also take other demographics to consideration, but these are the key ones. As part of our study, we will use four standardized scales, namely the grief measurement scale and the prolonged grief disorder scale to measure the presence of grief and prolonged grief respectively. The Lexington pet attachment scale to understand the relationship between pet attachment and the grief experience and the continuing bond interview which focuses on the components of continuing bond such as dreams about the pet, memorials, influence, talking with pet, lessons from pet. In addition, we will use the love emotional availability of parents scale for children and adolescents to better understand the support they got from parents. In addition, our study will incorporate a narrative approach which focuses on the aspects such as experience of losing pet, difficult aspects faced or encountered after losing pet, any supporting system available, personal resources, any rituals done for pet, coping strategies used and level of support from veterinary. To understand the uniqueness in ambiguous versus an ambiguous grief experience, we will examine level of support received, coping mechanisms used, meaning derived from the experience and overall thoughts about the experience. And since veterinarians can be a vital source of support in grief experience related to pet loss, the current study also examines veterinarians' experience and awareness about the grief their clients undertook. We will use a narrative approach with semi-structured interview examining aspects such as awareness about grief associated with pet bereavement and its impact, resources presented or needed, impact on the veterinarian, experience of dealing with clients undergoing grief, what is the vet's role in that. Another possibility that we plan to examine based on our initial findings is of uncovering the familial dynamics and experience surrounding pet loss. Overall, we believe that our research will help uncover several vital aspects related to grief that emerges from pet loss and enable helping professionals and veterinarians to provide better support to pet parents. Once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Show present the paper Animal Welfare and Social Media presented by G. Sujita, MH Scholar, VOC College of Education, Tutukri. Rhinoceros. Here, said about rhinoceros, internet uses other animals. It's very clear that animal related content predominated online, as evidenced by the abundance of animal focused YouTube channels and the popularity of animal accounts on to Instagram. And these are the countless cute and humorous profiles, videos and images that are meant to amuse users. And uh, the animal rights uh, such as uh, rescue organizations or educational YouTube channels are run by individuals or animal rights organization. It is evident from the number of followers that these channels and profiles are not ignored or suppressed. The next one, the most common types of animal abuse. Neglect, hoarding, shooting, fighting, beating, mutilation, throwing, stabbing, burning, vehicular. Next one, the signs of animal abuse. Dogs are, dogs are chained up all day without food, water and shelter. Untreated wounds. Small nourished animals uh, document everything you see and report it. The more information you have, the more useful the information will be useful to law enforcement. A difference between animal welfare and animal rights, which is 
here animal rights is uh, based on the idea that animal should not be used by the people for any reason and here the animal rights should uh, protect their uh, interests the way human rights protect people and uh, animal welfare is nothing but uh, designed to govern the treatment of animals who are being dominated by humans whether for food research or entertainment and the criteria is comes under domination oppression exploitation powerlessness cultural imperialism violence and here the social media is referred as uh, the first success of animal culture by harrison inspired carol to send monstrous t bros to work under harrison supervision in 1909 and here therefore blood plasma had became a major culture medium for a variety of animal cells he successfully cultivated chicken embryonic cells by using chicken blood plasma which is readily available and later successfully cultivated mammalian cell as well within a periodic exchange and here the conclusion the finally in recent years the ongoing discussion regarding how the internet and social media in particular have affected social movements and society have become more continuous it is difficult to argue against the widespread usage of social media to advance animal welfare and rights and here the 